topic of Calvinism. A Calvinism. Of Calvinism. You're Calvinist. A Calvinist. You're Calvinism. 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 Calvinistic. Calvinism. This Calvinism. I'm Calvinist. A Calvinist. A Calvinist. Hello, Jeff Fowler here. Uh, it's no secret that the new IFB opposes Calvinism. Uh, you'll find it in their doctrinal statements. Now, you don't find extensive doctrinal statements uh, in their churches. Usually it's a one-page list of what they believe or don't believe, but included among that is their opposition to Calvinism. Now, you don't see opposition to Mormonism or Seventh-day Adventism or the Jehovah's Witnesses or other things like that, uh, but specifically, you see Calvinism singled out. The question I'd like to look at is, is why? You know, it is, uh, it's quite a, a leap to take such a position. Now, it's one thing to say we disagree with the Calvinists on this point or that point. You know, uh, even Stephen Anderson had to admit that uh, the Baptist Confession, the 1689 Baptist Confession, has a lot of good stuff in it you know, that doesn't oppose his position. He actually began to go through it. I don't know if he followed through with that or not. Uh, but uh, statements of doctrine, which are clear that, that nearly every Christian would agree on. Uh, so uh, he, they've taken this position, however, and if you hold to the points of Calvinism, uh, they do condemn you as a heretic. Now, one thing that they do in doing so is that they isolate themselves from history. You now, you think of, for example, the, the Bible translations, William Tyndall, uh, the King James Bible itself. Uh, there, there was a huge Calvinistic influence there. You know, uh, Tyndall, as I've mentioned before, was burned at the stake. One of the reasons, because he denied free will. You know, so whenever you do this, and, and you, you isolate yourself uh, from these martyrs, uh, the, the martyrs under Bloody Mary, uh, the pilgrims who came to, to the United States, they brought with them a copy of the Geneva Bible, which had Reformed notes in it. Calvinistic notes. And so when you look at this, uh, what they've done is they completely isolated themselves uh, from their roots, from the, the, the historic uh, Christian roots of the United States and Europe. <coughs> and uh, so I'd like to know why they have done so. There's, there is a reason for that. There's a historic reason for this animosity. And the uh, reason partly goes, and I think primarily goes, there's two, two people in the old IFB that you don't find them condemning. And nearly everybody in the old IFB uh, is condemned uh, by the new IFB. You know, they've decided to cut ties with them. They, they've gone their own way. So they, 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 have, uh, they pretty much speak negatively of most of the old IFB. But there's two preachers in particular, which they do not. One, of course, is Jack Kyles uh, that, that provides, I believe, the, the background uh, for the, the new IFB and the other. But the doctrine that you've got to repent of all of your sins and then put your faith in Christ and you can be saved is heresy. It's a fundamentalist heresy and it is a salvation by works. And the other is Curtis Hudson. I like to focus primarily on Curtis Hudson. Uh, and now, the man of the hour, Dr. Curtis Hudson.
Over here, Bella. That's it. Uh, now, Jack House was obviously uh, not a Calvinist, and he would occasionally mention it in a negative fashion, uh, but he didn't go on the tirades uh, like you see uh, within the new IFB. And, 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 and the introduction to this video, I just took a, a little bit of time and picked out a few of the many hundreds of sermons you can find against Calvinism that is posted by the new IFB and it goes seems to go in waves you know if you have Stephen Anderson preach a sermon against Calvinism it's going to be followed by some of the other preachers who will then follow uh, his example and break out the old Calvinistic notes and and start preaching against it so uh, another thing to, to consider is some some of these guys are, are upset at me because of my opposition to that. Well, remember, I'm not the one who fired the first shot. You know, as, as a reform minister, I look on YouTube and I find this constant barrage of uh, anti-Calvinistic sermons and, and teachings and directed at us, calling us heretics. Whereas, uh, let's just take a look here. This is just an example, uh, the, perhaps the most vocal example uh, that I was able to find concerning Curtis Hudson. I'm sure there's more out there as I don't have the time to to comb through all of the old, of the, the new IFB videos, but here's one by Mr. Stuckey on uh, on Curtis Hudson. Now, Curtis Hudson was a preacher in the 20th century, and he passed away around 25 years ago, and he went home to be with the Lord. And he was a very zealous soul winner, and uh, he took a real strong stand on salvation. And uh, you know, he's also very zealously King James only. Now, I, I get a little impatient with people who teach Calvinism and say some are elected to be saved and some are elected to be lost and some couldn't get saved no matter what because they weren't elected. I have never met a non-elected Calvinist. They're all elected. It's the others that are not elected. Now, stay with me. Now, that's a bunch of hogwash. Don't get mad. That's a bunch of hogwash. I mean, applesauce. <clears throat> salvation. Jesus died for the whole world. That's the scope of salvation. Nobody will ever look out of hell up to heaven and say, Jesus, I want to be saved, but you didn't die for me. No, if a man goes to hell, it won't be because he had to go to hell. It'd be because he would not trust Jesus Christ as Savior. Curtis Hudson laid the historic framework for the anti-Calvinism that you find within the new IFB. Jack Howells, of course, mentioned it. He opposed the doctrine of election and went against his soul-winning efforts, things like that, according in his view. Uh, but Curtis Hudson was the one who really laid the groundwork. I have with me here a book that I've had since I was a student at Howells and Anderson. And this is uh, Dr. Hudson's book on why I disagree with all five points of Calvinism. This is still available, and of course, it's with different printing today. Uh, but in this booklet, you find some of this, the, the basic arguments that are used uh, in the new IFB in their sermons. Uh, for example, you'll find the mention of Matthew chapter uh, 23, verse 37. This is a standard argument against Calvinism. Let me just read what Dr. Hudson had to say here. Um, while the Bible teaches the depravity of the human race, and he's talking about total inability on page 4. It nowhere teaches total inability. The Bible never hints that people are lost because they have no ability to come to Christ. The language of Jesus was, you will not come to me that you that ye may have life, John 5.40. Notice it's not a matter of whether or not you can come to Christ. It is a matter of whether or not you will come to Christ. Jesus looked over Jerusalem and wept, said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. And ye would not, Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. These are standard arguments. You'll hear this constantly uh, as you listen through the sermons of the new IFB explaining uh, the idea that men have ability, men have free will uh, to come to Christ. 
um, which which I mentioned before, this goes beyond the old semi-Pelagianism of fundamentalism, you know, or even the Wesleyans. Uh, it, it is the full-blown Pelagianism where the, the doctrine of original sin is denied and total depravity is denied and that man is completely free to make a spiritual choice. You know, despite the fact that he is carnally minded, he can't understand the law of God, can't submit himself to the law of God. Spiritual things are something that they, they can't comprehend according to the scriptures, but they're able to when it comes to, to this. Uh, but nevertheless, you see these standard arguments. Now, how, how he answers John 6 is interesting as well, because I've seen this exact argument uh, also, where it says some Calvinists use John 6.44 in an effort to prove total inability. Here the Bible says no man can come. See, there you have the word. You have the word of, it, of ability. No man can come. Uh, to me, unless the Father which sent me, which, which has sent me, draw him. But the Bible makes it plain in John 12, 32, that Jesus will draw all men unto himself. Here the Bible says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. So this is the very same argument. You'll, you'll find this constantly. You know, well, they say, Calvinists say that, that you can't come because Jesus said in John 6, but in John 12, he says that you can come because all men will be drawn. So here you have John separated from chapter 6 way over to chapter 12. Well, let's explain chapter 6 by pulling a verse out of chapter 12 without looking at the context. I've, I've done this before in my Calvinistic channel uh, with explaining this particular passage, that the context of John chapter 12 is that Philip has brought Greeks to Jesus. Greeks came where we want to see Jesus, and Philip was then bringing them to Jesus. But Jesus was on his way to the cross, and he was he, he was uh, feeling the burden of the cross in a very heavy way, and and uh, that's where we have the voice coming from heaven and all of that. But specifically, where Jesus said, "I will draw all men unto me," he's thinking of the Greeks. The Greeks were considered by the Jews as being Gentile dogs. What what do they have with Jehovah God? Jesus is pointing this out. So. They take from chapter 6, where Jesus is making a statement of why these people who were hearing him would not come to him. It's because you cannot come to, to, to the Father unless you're drawn by the Father. And they'll take over in chapter 12, where you have a whole different context, and they'll pull that verse over there. I've, I spent a whole video on this, but, but nevertheless, that's the argument that you, you see used by the end, new IFB, and it comes directly from this booklet by Dr. Uh, Curtis Hudson. On page 6, he makes this statement on unconditional election. By unconditional election, Calvin meant that some are elected to heaven while others are elected to hell. And that this election is unconditional. See, uh, here you have a very similar argument. Uh, but the argument here is not consistent with true Calvinistic belief. Uh, a Calvinist is not going to say that a person is elected to hell. Election is a positive thing. Uh, people... <clears throat> All people are condemned already. So there is no, no question as the condemnation of all men. All men, having been born on this earth, are born into sin with a sin nature, born as enemies of God, as children of wrath, and they're all condemned. So God doesn't have to pick and choose. You're going to hell, you're going to hell. They all are. Election is where God, of his own will, chooses some out of that group that are, that are on their way to hell and elects them to eternal life, chooses them for eternal life. You know, so it's a whole uh, different concept. He's not accurately portraying what a Calvinist believes. Uh, by unconditional election, Calvin meant that God has already decided who will be saved and who will be lost. Well, it's already been decided in the garden. You eat of this fruit, you'll surely die. The wages of sin is death. All are condemned. So uh, that has been decided. God chooses to have mercy on some. Some he chooses to have mercy and some he doesn't. Uh, that's his sovereign choice. Uh, as God, he's able to do that. That's the Calvinistic position. But the argument uh, is made by Hudson, which is, of course, the same argument you'll hear from the new IFB. Of course, you have the anti-evangelism that Calvinists don't believe in evangelism. Uh, this teaching insists that we need not try to win men to Christ because men cannot be saved unless God has planned for them to be saved. Calvinists do not teach that. You now we have evangelistic efforts. We want to, to get the message to all people. The reason for that is we do believe in election. 
we do believe that God has his people, just as he had in Corinth. When you look into the book of Acts, when, when Paul went into Corinth and, and God told him, don't be afraid to go into Corinth. I have much people here. Before he even preached the gospel, uh, God had already set aside people for himself. And Paul was going to call them. Uh, we have the Holy Spirit forbidding them to go into Asia, the apostles. Don't go here. I want you to go here. There was people, that were the elect, that were to be gathered up. Paul didn't know who they were. He preached to all of them. So you have this misrepresentation, which you find in the new IFB. You also find it in uh, Curtis Hudson. Now, we could go on through this book, but I don't want to continue. But you're going to find here uh, the I identical arguments. Uh, this is really, I think, the source, one of the sources at least, a very primary source of the new IFB's opposition and hatred of Calvinism. Uh, so why then, and just summarizing this up, why then do new IFB preachers spend so much time harping on Calvinism? Well, one, and I've already mentioned this many times, that Calvinism most clearly refutes uh, the NI NIFB heresies, new IFB heresies. You know, the heresies concerning repentance, the heresies concerning uh, antinomianism, you know, that a person can be saved and continue on in their sin. They will accuse Calvinists of preaching lordship salvation, that you must recognize Christ as Lord. And we do believe that, that a person must recognize Christ as Lord to be saved. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. Who For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, you have to know who he is. Of course we recognize that, but we do not, we do not believe that a person has to work up of themselves good works in a legalistic fashion in order to be accepted by God, even after they claim to be saved. Well, I'm not going to be saved if I don't have good works, so i got to produce these good works. No. no. What we believe is that a person is, because of their new nature, going to have these good works flowing from them. A whole different idea of life and obedience comes because of the Holy Spirit's presence within the believer. And so these, this presence of the Holy Spirit is shown by that person's good works. That's all we're saying. We're not saying that these good works somehow merit your salvation. Well, that is utter nonsense. Uh, secondly, most likely they preach this, this idea of, of um, <clears throat> anti-Calvinism. They're so anti-Calvinistic because uh, their roots are historical roots. Go back to Curtis Hudson and Jack Hiles. Not, not primarily Jack Howells when it comes to Calvinism. I believe that, that both of them have the idea of repentance. You know, the, the, they, they preach the same anti-repentance gospel, non-repentance gospel, that you don't have to turn from your sins to be saved. They both preach that, Howells and, and Hudson. Hudson, having access to the sword of the Lord and the printing press uh, before the days of the Internet, put these ideas into print. Now, you'll find some of that in Jack Howells' works, but... but Primarily, I think it was Hudson who was the one who solidified, codified this, this doctrine and uh, is, is then uh, the source of the new IFB heresies. You know, so if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comment section. May the Lord bless you in your search for truth. And that's why I consider pretty much any Calvinist to be lost. I, I, I just do. I, I don't believe, I, I'm sure there's exceptions that are out there, but I think it's a very rare thing. I'm going to treat them all as lost. If I run into one out soul winning, I'm going to treat him as always lost. I'm going to try to get him saved.